Yes, I know that the thumbnail is a bit clickbaity, but I couldn't fit the entire title into it. Uh, I'm paraphrasing Tenacious D when I say this is not about the greatest perfumes in the world, but it's definitely a tribute. Some might actually argue that the five perfumes I'm going to talk about in this video are amongst the greatest that have ever been created. And specifically, you could point to the fact that all of these perfumes have been in production for more than 50 years, in some cases over 60 years. So I'm going to talk about five perfumes, one from Hermes, two from Guerlain, one from Chanel and one from Dior that were all initially released in the, from the early 50s through to the, through the mid 60s. These have gone on to become classic perfumes. Four of them were created specifically for the men's perfume market, marketed to, to men. The first one, though, that I'm going to talk about, uh, released in 1951, the first uh, of Edmund Rudnitska's perfumes that are featured here. This is Eau de Mez. Now, I, I should say at this point that I'm talking about these specifically because I never came to these classics classic perfumes through trying vintages. I have all only ever been exposed to modern versions of these. I've smelled some older versions of some of these perfumes, but the reason I'm making this video is because I want to I want to show my appreciation for the fact that these classic perfumes to my nose are still great perfumes. Now there, I'm not going to argue with anyone who's experienced older versions, who, who I, I understand fully that these over 60, 50 years will definitely have changed through necessary reformulations, restrictions, what have you, cost cutting. But what I'm here to tell you and what I'm making this video about is the fact that these are still really, really, at the very minimum, really, really good perfumes, if not still great perfumes in their modern versions. So I'll get that out of the way. Now back to Eau de Mets. So originally released in 1951, and I'm no perfume historian, but from what I read and what I understand, this was Hermes' first foray into perfumery. Before, before that, it was all about leather goods. Uh, they entered the perfume market with Eau de Mets. Now, I'm just going to get some strips so I don't have to spray all of these on my skin tonight. And I'll give you a brief description of each because, look, I understand that a lot of you will have smelled these perfumes. You know what I'm talking about. So, common denominator with all these perfumes tonight is, is that they all have citrus openings, um, which was probably, I guess, pretty common back back in the day, but they've all got wonderful citrus openings. And this one, um, mainly bergamot, is, is the one that comes through the most, but this is paired with spices. Um, there is, a, in this version, there is a touch of sort of dirty spice, like like a warm, sweaty spice like cumin. I, it's definitely not stinky in that way, especially not this formulation anyway. And what it dries down into is this, is this lovely, soft, birchy leather. Um, and again, it's very, very refined. It's not it's not as uh, rough and smoky as, as some other birch tar levers that you can find out there. I have mentioned on my channel before that my first experience with Eau de Mets is actually from a decant, from an older version of this. I think there's only like one or two formulations prior to this one with the copper bottle or pewter bottle cap. Uh, but I actually prefer 
this current modern version, the citruses are a little bit more amped up, which I think makes it more versatile. I really love wearing Eau de Mez in, in warmer weather, um, more so than, than the colder weather, even though a lot of people might not think it, you know, from a seasonal perspective is, is suited to warmer weather. I think it's fantastic, just purely because of the citruses and the way they intermingle with the spices. Okay, that's 1951, still going strong. All the versions of it, um, from what I read, people love most of the versions of it. I love this version. So you can smell it. Then mid 50s, Chanel enters the masculine perfume market and they release Poi Monsieur. This is the EDT. This is the current version again. This is described as a citrus ship. And again, this has, oh man, this has a, another beautiful citrus opening, more dominated by lemons in my, in my opinion. Um, it, it's, it's a brighter, uh, sparklier opening than the Eau de Mer's. There are some like hints of floral notes in, in the mids. I'm not, I couldn't tell you exactly what, what they are, but there's something that softens things up all before drying down to a, a gorgeous velvety mossy base. It's just, it's just the definition of refinement and elegance, Paul Monsieur. So remember, mid fifties, this is the EDT. They've released, they've since released an Eau de Parfum version, which my understanding is, and I haven't smelled it, is that there are, it's a hint of, there are more hints of sweetness in it. I think there's a vanilla note in there, but this is just fantastic. And not all of these, uh, and I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, not, most of these are not monsters in a performance sense. Now, I, I, even though they're very, very soft projection sillage wise, they stick around, they still stick around on the skin, um, albeit, you know, you have to sniff closely, but they, they stick around on the skin, you know, a good several hours, all of these, uh, even though you have to try a little bit to smell them. So, but you know, just reapply, reapply. None of these are overly expensive either. Um, and what I'll do when I, when I finish talking about the rest of the perfumes, I'll, I'll give you a mini on the spot ranking of which ones I love the most. So 1951, Eau Mer's 1955, Paul Monsieur. Then we get to 1959 and Guerlain. Um, they, They've already released perfumes uh, specifically for the masculine market, uh, things like Mouchoir de Monsieur uh, that came sort of as a masculine version for Jiki, for instance. Uh, but in 59, they released Vetiva. And again, this is the second last version that you can, that you could buy. I bought this when it was the only version. Now they've changed all of these mass Guerlain has changed the masculine uh perfumes into those square bottles these are what are, what are not what are known as the listerine bottles um and again vetiver as you can tell from the name is based on that gorgeous earthy woody note of vetiver but it dominates from the beginning but is brightened again by a bergamot note, a little bit of lemon, but there is there are other warm spices. It's it's almost um, it's not the same as cumin. It's like it it is a nutmeg, and there's a dry tobacco note in the buried in there as well. So by the by the end of the fifties, there's there's like great variations coming out already, um, especially for men who were wanting, I guess, something different to what was out there already for women or something a little bit different to the 
lavender fougères that have been out for a while, like Jiki and um, Mouchoir de Monsieur and Port en Homme. Um, things kind of started changing towards these citrus woody perfumes. But then Guerlain, in the mid 60s, decide to release Habit Rouge. Uh, I have the EDT, so I think I might be wrong. I think the original was EDT, but someone can correct me on that. They did release an Eau de Parfum decades later, uh, but, but this was released. And from what I read uh, was, I guess, a uh, men's answer to their famous Shalimar. And what I can say about that is, yes, there are parallels in the way this is constructed. So again, with Habi Rouge, we have a beautiful, almost candied lemon uh, opening, but candied because here, where vetiver obviously is dominated by vetiver, here it's dominated by vanilla. Now, th that doesn't mean that, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just losing my voice. That doesn't mean that uh, it is, uh, you know, lemon, lemon meringue style gourmand, gourmand kind of perfume. It, it opens bright lemon, um, the vanilla is there from the get-go, and then it's softened by other florals. There's a touch of rose in the middle, uh, other woods, a little touch of leather. It's almost a suede that comes through in the middle as well. And and so, yeah, you can, you can call it the masculine answer to Shalimar, but where Shalimar is dominated by that heavy labdanum even with the with the citruses at the top this one is really about the vanilla how it interplays with the the floral notes in the middle the leather and that that almost uh lemon cleaning scent at the at the top it's not a very natural lemon but it is it adds to its charm now if you were to ask me of the four I've already talked about, which one might, I hate to use this term, but the one that might smell the most dated, it would probably be Habit Rouge because I, I think that this style of perfume is not as in vogue today as the other three are, even though they've been around since the, the 50s, they still have a modern feel and construction about them where you don't see many perfumes being made with the same type of uh, composition or structure as Habit Rouge by Guerlain. So the last one I'm going to talk about, 66, and it's uh, full circle to Edmund Rudnitska again, this time with Dior, um, releasing Au Sauvage. EDT. <laughs> I'll just turn that around for you. Citrus, aromatic, um, floral, mossy base. Now, admittedly, from the from the, my friends who know vintages of this version, it's probably the modern version is not as mossy as earlier versions used to be, which is fine because again, I haven't smelled those older versions and. Um, I've only fallen in love with the one that is available now. And this one is, again, probably of, of the other perfumes the most similar to Paul Monsieur, but this has a lighter, airy, more floral heart uh, than Paul Monsieur. And rather than dry down into the mossy base that, that Paul Monsieur does it, it basically turns into citrus twigs and and grows into the actual woody stems of those plants uh flower blossoms around it it's just can you tell that they've all got a particular charm that like just mesmerizes me when I smell them and and you can you can smell these things and just 
instantly understand why they became classics, why they have such good uh, longevity in terms of being in production. They they are all prototypes for perfumes that uh, were made years later. Like you can tell smelling or their meds, how much this might have influenced someone like Jean-Claude Elena when he made Cartier's Declaration or even Hermès's uh, Epis Marine, for instance. They all have callbacks to Eau Um I, I don't have to tell you how many Vetiver perfumes have come out since Guerlain released Vetiver and how how few of them have either equaled or even managed to surpass the original. Uh, like I said, they're still... Abit Rouge is probably the most unique one of these perfumes, um, and I'm yet to smell anything that really sort of reminds me of it, that's, uh, that's influential. So it's unique, it's its own thing, uh, but it's probably... The, the most acquired taste of the lot. Uh, and and these two, you know, just uh, instant classics for summer perfume wear, warm weather classics. You can't you can't not smell good wearing wearing these two perfumes, either of them. So having said that, I'm gonna tell you what my favorites uh my favorites of the five currently are uh i'm gonna i'm gonna say because based on my last top 10 video oh their meds was in my top five and then i'm gonna go for Abbey rouge because this has been a long time perennial favorite top five perfume and I've got to say, I'm loving Paul Monsieur just ahead of Au Sauvage. And finally, Yelan Vetiva is fifth. Not that I dislike this, I love it a lot. Uh, and it, actually, in the first six months of this year, this has been one of my most worn perfumes. And it's definitely one that, to my nose, gets better and better with each wear. So, I hope that that um has actually encouraged you to to give modern versions of classic perfumes a, a try um by all means if you're if you want to go down the vintage road go for it i i'm not the guy to help you with that there are other champ youtubers uh reviewers who can give you the the right information about vintages if you want to go down that road but I'm here to tell you, and maybe as, as someone watching this channel that's new to perfume and has read about some of these perfumes, smell the, smell the new ones first. And if you like them, then my, my advice would be, if you really like this, then do you really need to go for the vintage? I don't know. I don't want to be too controversial and start drama, <laughs> but... All I'm saying is that they're all great. I love them and I wanted to pay this tribute to five classics from the 50s and 60s. So I'll see you for the next video and thank you for watching.